Hello there. Welcome to this Jupyter Notebook where we'll be using CNN to perform image classification on the brain tumor dataset. In this particular cell, we're importing the necessary libraries that we'll be using throughout the notebook. As you can see, we have a comment that explains the purpose of this notebook and why we're using transfer learning instead of training a neural network from scratch. We also have an image of a brain to give you a visual representation of what we're working with. Let's move on to the next cell and see what we have there. Great! In this cell, we're importing a bunch of libraries that we'll be using throughout the notebook. These libraries include Matplotlib, NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn, OpenCV, TensorFlow, and more. We're also importing some specific modules from TensorFlow, such as Image Data Generator, which will help us augment our data, and Efficient Net Zero, which is a pre-trained neural network that we'll be using for transfer learning. We're also importing some modules that will help us with data pre-processing and model evaluation, such as Shuffle, Train underscore Test underscore Split, Classification underscore Report, and Confusion underscore Matrix. Finally, we're importing some modules that will help us with visualization and interactivity, such as IP widgets, IO, PIL, and IPython.display. And at the end, we're just printing out the file paths of the brain tumor dataset that we'll be using. All right, let's take a look at this markdown cell. As you can see, it's just a heading that says color. This cell doesn't contain any code but it's still important because it's giving us some context for what we'll be doing next. In this section, we'll be exploring the role of color in image classification and how we can use it to improve our model's performance. So, stay tuned for the next cell where we'll dive deeper into this topic. Now, let's take a look at this code cell. Here, we're defining three different color palettes using the Seaborn library. The first palette is called colors underscore dark and it contains five different shades of gray. The second palette is called colors underscore red and it contains five different shades of red. And the third palette is called colors underscore green and it contains five different shades of green. After defining these palettes, we're using the sns.palplot function to display them. This function is a part of the Seaborn library and it allows us to visualize color palettes. As you can see, we have three different plots, each showing the five colors in their respective palettes. Why are we doing this? Well, in the next section, we'll be exploring the role of color in image classification. By defining these color palettes, we'll be able to use them to create visualizations that will help us understand how different colors affect our model's performance. So, stay tuned for the next cell where we'll dive deeper into this topic. Now, let's move on to the next cell which is a markdown cell titled Data Preparation. This cell is where we will start preparing our data for image classification. In this section, we will be importing the necessary libraries and loading our dataset. We will also be performing some data cleaning and preprocessing to ensure that our data is ready for analysis. Stay tuned for the next cell where we will dive deeper into the data preparation process. In this cell, we are defining the labels for our image classification task. These labels represent the different types of brain tumors that we will be classifying in our dataset. The four labels are glioma underscore tumor, no underscore tumor, meningioma underscore tumor, and pituitary underscore tumor. By defining these labels, we can easily identify and categorize the images in our dataset. This is an important step in the data preparation process as it helps us to organize and analyze our data effectively. In the next cell, we will be loading our data set and assigning these labels to the corresponding images. Welcome back! In this markdown cell titled Data Preparation Continued, we will be discussing how we prepare our images for image classification. First, we append all the images from the directories into a Python list. Then, we resize the images and convert them into NumPy arrays. This is an important step in the data preparation process as it allows us to standardize the size and format of our images, making them easier to analyze. Stay tuned for the next cell where we will be performing further preprocessing on our data. In this cell, we are preparing our data for image classification by loading our data set and assigning labels to the corresponding images. 
We start by defining an empty list for our training data and labels. We then set the image size to 150 and loop through each label in our dataset. For each label, we access the corresponding folder in our dataset and loop through each image in that folder. We read in the image using OpenCV, resize it to our desired image size, and append it to our training data list. We also append the corresponding label to our label list. We repeat this process for both our training and testing datasets. Finally, we convert our training data and labels to NumPy arrays. This is an important step in the data preparation process as it allows us to standardize the size and format of our images, making them easier to analyze. In this cell, we are creating a figure with four subplots using the subplots function from the matplotlib library. We set the figure size to 20 by 20 and assign it to the variables fig and ax. We then add a title to the figure using the fig.txt function, which says sample image from each label in bold, monospace font with a dark color. Next, we loop through each label in the labels list and check if the corresponding image in the training data has the same label. If it does, we display the image in the corresponding subplot using the mshow function and set the title of the subplot to the label using the set underscore title function. We also turn off the axis using the axis function. Overall, this code is creating a visual representation of the brain tumor images for each label in the dataset. Now that we have created a visual representation of the brain tumor images for each label in the dataset, we want to make sure that our training data is randomized. This is important because we want to avoid any bias in our model training. To achieve this, we are using the shuffle function from the splurn.utils module. We pass in our training data x underscore train and labels y underscore train as arguments, along with a random underscore state value of 101. This ensures that the shuffling is consistent across different runs of the code. By shuffling our data, we can ensure that our model is not biased towards any particular set of images or labels. This will help us to create a more accurate and reliable model for classifying brain tumor images. In this cell, we are simply checking the shape of our training data x underscore train. The output tells us that we have 3,264 images in our training set, each with a size of 150 by 150 pixels and three color channels, RGB. This information is important for understanding the size and format of our data, which will be used in the next steps of our analysis. Now that we have shuffled our data, the next step is to divide it into training and testing sets. This is important because we want to evaluate the performance of our model on data that it has not seen before. To do this, we will use the train underscore test underscore split function from the splurn.model underscore selection module. We will pass in our shuffled data x underscore train and labels y underscore train as arguments, along with the test underscore size value of 0.2. This means that 20% of our data will be used for testing, while the remaining 80% will be used for training. We will also set a random underscore state value of 101 to ensure that the splitting is consistent across different runs of the code. Once we have split our data, we will have four variables, x underscore train, x underscore test, y underscore train, and y underscore test. x underscore train and y underscore train will contain the training data and labels, while x underscore test and y underscore test will contain the testing data and labels. We will use the training data and labels to train our model and then evaluate its performance on the testing data and labels. This will give us an idea of how well our model is able to generalize to new, unseen data. Now, we are splitting our training data into two parts, a smaller portion for validation and a larger portion for actual training. This is done using the train underscore test underscore split function from the splurn.model underscore selection module. We pass in our x underscore train and y underscore train variables, along with the test underscore size parameter of 0.1, which means that 10% of our training data will be used for validation. We also set a random underscore state of 101 to ensure that the split is reproducible. The resulting variables are x underscore train, x underscore test, y underscore train, and y underscore test, which we will use to train and evaluate our model. 
Now that we have split our data into training and validation sets, we need to prepare our labels for the model. In this cell, we are performing one hot encoding on the labels. This is a technique used to convert categorical data, like our tumor labels, into numerical values that the model can understand. After converting the labels into numerical values, we use one hot encoding to create a binary matrix for each label. This matrix will have a 1 in the column corresponding to the label and zeros in all other columns. This ensures that the model doesn't interpret the numerical values as having any sort of order or hierarchy. By using one-hot encoding, we can accurately represent our labels in a way that the model can learn from. Now that we have split our data into training and validation sets, we need to prepare our labels for the model. In this cell, we are converting our categorical tumor labels into numerical values that the model can understand. We first create two empty lists, y underscore train underscore new and y underscore test underscore new, to store the numerical values of our labels. We then loop through each label in y underscore train and y underscore test and append its corresponding numerical value to the respective list using the index method. Once we have converted our labels into numerical values, we use the to underscore categorical function from the tf.keras.utils module to perform one hot encoding on our labels. This creates a binary matrix for each label, with a 1 in the column corresponding to the label and zeros in all other columns. This ensures that the model doesn't interpret the numerical values as having any sort of order or hierarchy. By using one hot encoding, we can accurately represent our labels in a way that the model can learn from. So, in summary, this cell is converting our categorical tumor labels into numerical values and performing one hot encoding on them to prepare them for the model. In this markdown cell, we are introduced to the concept of transfer learning. This is a technique where we can use pre-trained models that were developed for standard computer vision benchmark datasets, such as the ImageNet image recognition tasks, to shortcut the process of training deep convolutional neural network models. We will be using the efficient net zero model which will use the weights from the ImageNet dataset. The include underscore top parameter is set to false so that the network doesn't include the top layer slash output layer from the pre-built model which allows us to add our own output layer depending upon our use case. Now we move on to the next cell where we will be creating our model using transfer learning. We will be using the efficient net zero model which is a pre-trained model developed for the image net image recognition tasks. By setting the weights parameter to ImageNet, we are using the weights from the pre-trained model. The include underscore top parameter is set to false so that we can add our own output layer depending upon our use case. Lastly, we specify the input underscore shape parameter to match the size of our images. This will create our model architecture and download the pre-trained weights from the internet. In this markdown cell, we are introduced to three layers that we will be using to create our model. The first layer is the global average pooling 2D layer which acts similar to the max pooling layer in CNNs, but instead of using the maximum value, it uses the average value while pooling. This helps in decreasing the computational load on the machine while training. The second layer is the dropout layer which emits some of the neurons at each step from the layer, making the neurons more independent from the neighboring neurons. This helps in avoiding overfitting. The rate parameter is the likelihood of a neuron activation being set to zero, thus dropping out the neuron. Lastly, we have the dense layer which is the output layer that classifies the image into one of the four possible classes. It uses the softmax function which is a generalization of the sigmoid function. Welcome back! In this cell, we are creating our model using the efficient net zero architecture we talked about earlier. First, we set our model variable to the output of the efficient net zero model. Next, we add a global average pooling 2D layer to our model. This layer takes the average of all the feature maps in the previous layer and flattens them into a single vector. After that, we add a dropout layer with a rate of 0 0.5. Dropout is a technique used to prevent overfitting by randomly dropping out some of the neurons during training. Finally, we add a dense layer with 4 units and a softmax activation function. This layer will output the probabilities for each of the 4 possible classes. 
And that's it for this cell. We have now created our model using the efficient net zero architecture with some additional layers to help with classification. In this cell, we are using the summary function to display a summary of our model's architecture and parameters. This function provides us with a table that shows the layers in our model, their output shapes, and the number of parameters in each layer. As we can see, our model has several layers, including the efficient net zero layer, the global average pooling 2D layer, the dropout layer, and the dense layer. The table also shows the total number of trainable and non-trainable parameters in our model. Using the summary function is a great way to get an overview of our model's architecture and ensure that everything is set up correctly. Now that we have created our model, it's time to compile it. Compiling a model means that we are configuring it for training by specifying the optimizer, loss function, and metrics. In this case, we are using the Atom Optimizer, which is a popular optimization algorithm for deep learning. We are also using the Categorical Cross Entropy Loss function, which is commonly used for multi-class classification problems like ours. Lastly, we are specifying that we want to track the accuracy metric during training and evaluation. Compiling our model is an important step before we can start training it. It ensures that our model is set up correctly and ready to learn from our data. Now that we have created our model, it's time to compile it. Compiling the model is an important step before training it. In this cell, we are using the compile function to compile our model. We are specifying the loss function to be categorical cross entropy, the optimizer to be atom, and the metric to be accuracy. The loss function is used to measure how well the model is able to predict the correct output. The optimizer is used to adjust the weights of the model during training to minimize the loss function. The accuracy metric is used to measure how well the model is able to predict the correct output compared to the actual output. Now let's talk about callbacks. Callbacks are functions that can help you fix bugs more quickly and build better models. They can help you visualize how your model's training is going and even prevent overfitting. In this markdown cell, we see that the presenter will be using three specific callback functions, TensorBoard, Model Checkpoint, and Reducer Run Plateau. These functions will allow us to monitor the training process, save the best model during training, and adjust the learning rate if the model's performance plateaus. So, callbacks are a powerful tool that can help us improve our models and make the training process more efficient. Now, let's take a look at the code in this cell. Here, we are defining three callback functions that we will use during the training process. The first one is called TensorBoard. This function allows us to visualize the training process in real time using graphs and charts. We specify the log underscore dear parameter to tell the function where to save the logs. The second function is called model checkpoint. This function allows us to save the best model during training. We specify the monitor parameter to tell the function which metric to monitor for improvement. In this case, we are monitoring the validation accuracy. We also set save underscore best underscore only to true, which means that the function will only save the model if the monitored metric improves. The mode parameter is set to auto, which means that the function will automatically determine whether to maximize or minimize the monitored metric. Finally, we set verbose to 1, which means that the function will print a message when it saves the model. The third function is called Reducer Run Plateau. This function allows us to adjust the learning rate if the model's performance plateaus. We specify the monitor parameter to tell the function which metric to monitor for improvement. In this case, we are monitoring the validation accuracy. The factor parameter is set to 0.3, which means that the learning rate will be reduced by a factor of 0.3 if the monitored metric does not improve after patient's number of epochs. The patient's parameter is set to 2, which means that the learning rate will be reduced if the monitored metric does not improve after 2 epochs. The min underscore delta parameter is set to 0.001, which means that the function will only consider a change in the monitored metric to be an improvement if it is greater than 0.001.
The mode parameter is set to auto, which means that the function will automatically determine whether to maximize or minimize the monitored metric. Finally, we set verbose to 1, which means that the function will print a message when it adjusts the learning rate. These three callback functions are powerful tools that can help us monitor the training process, save the best model, and adjust the learning rate if necessary. By using these functions, we can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our model training. Now we move on to the markdown cell which gives us a heads up about the training process. It says that training the model takes a lot of time, around 2 hours using CPU. However, if you have access to a GPU, it will barely take 5 minutes. So, if you have a GPU, it's recommended to use it for faster training. It's important to keep in mind that training a model can take a lot of time, so it's always good to be prepared and plan accordingly. In this cell, we are training our model using the fit function. We are passing in our training data x underscore train and y underscore train, and also specifying a validation split of 0.1, which means that 10% of our training data will be used for validation during training. We are also specifying the number of epochs to train for, which is 12 in this case. The verbose parameter is set to 1, which means that we will see progress updates during training. The batch underscore size parameter is set to 32, which means that we will be training our model on batches of 32 samples at a time. Finally, we are passing in our three callback functions tensorboard, checkpoint, and reduce underscore LR. These functions will be called during training to perform various tasks such as saving the best model, adjusting the learning rate, and visualizing the training process. As the model trains, we can see the progress of each epoch, including the loss and accuracy for both the training and validation sets. We can also see that the model checkpoint callback is saving the best model based on the validation accuracy, and the reducer RON plateau callback is adjusting the learning rate when the validation accuracy plateaus. In this cell, we are visualizing the training and validation accuracy and loss for each epoch. We start by creating a list of epochs from 0 to 11. Then, we create a figure with two subplots using plt.subplots. The size of the figure is set to 14 by 7 inches. Next, we extract the training and validation accuracy and loss from the history object that was returned by the fit function. We store these values in separate lists. We then plot the training and validation accuracy on the first subplot using ax0. Plot that we use green markers for the training accuracy and red markers for the validation accuracy. We also add a legend to the plot and label the X and Y axes. Similarly, we plot the training and validation loss on the second subplot using X1. Plot that we use green markers for the training loss and red markers for the validation loss. We also add a legend to the plot and label the X and Y axes. Finally, we show the figure using fig.show that this plot gives us a visual representation of how our model is performing during training. We can see if the model is overfitting or underfitting, and make adjustments accordingly. Welcome back! In this markdown cell, we're discussing how to make predictions using our model. The presenter has used the argmax function to find the index associated with the predicted outcome. Each row from the prediction array contains four values for the respective labels, and the maximum value in each row depicts the predicted output out of the four possible outcomes. By using argmax, we can easily find the index associated with the predicted outcome. This will be useful when we want to compare our predictions with the actual labels. Stay tuned for more! Now, let's move on to the code in this cell. Here, we are using our train model to make predictions on our test data. We first use the predict function to generate predictions for each sample in our test data. The output of this function is an array of four values for each sample, representing the probability of each possible outcome. Next, we use the argmax function to find the index associated with the predicted outcome. This is done by taking the maximum value in each row of the prediction array and returning its index. This will give us the predicted label for each sample in our test data. 
Finally, we use argmax again to convert our test labels from a one-hot encoded format to a single integer label. This is necessary for comparing our predicted labels with the actual labels in our test data. That's it for this cell. Stay tuned for more exciting content on Jupyter Notebook. Welcome back. In this markdown cell, we're discussing how to evaluate our model's performance. The presenter has provided a key for the four possible outcomes. Zero represents a glioma tumor, one represents no tumor, two represents a meningioma tumor, and three represents a pituitary tumor. This will be useful when we want to interpret our model's predictions and compare them with the actual labels. Stay tuned for more. Now, let's evaluate the performance of our model using the classification underscore report function. This function generates a report that includes precision, recall, and F1 score for each class, as well as the overall accuracy. The precision is the ratio of true positives to the total predicted positives, while recall is the ratio of true positives to the total actual positives. The F1 score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. The support is the number of samples in each class. The macro average is the unweighted mean of precision, recall, and F1 score across all classes, while the weighted average is the weighted mean of precision, recall, and F1 score, weighted by the number of samples in each class. As we can see from the report, our model has high precision, recall, and F1 score for each class, as well as high overall accuracy, indicating that it performs well on the test data. Now, we will create a heat map of the confusion matrix to visualize the performance of our model. The confusion matrix is a table that shows the number of true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives for each class. We use the confusion underscore matrix function to generate the matrix and then plot it using the sns.heatmap function. We pass in the test labels and predicted labels as arguments, along with the class labels for the x and y axes. We also set the onOut parameter to true to display the values in each cell, and use a green color map with dark borders for better visibility. Finally, we add a title to the figure using fig.txt and show the plot using plt.show.This heat map helps us to identify which classes our model is performing well on and which ones it is struggling with. Hey there! In this markdown cell, we have some bonus content to discuss, widgets. These are interactive elements that allow us to upload images from our local machine and predict whether an MRI scan has a brain tumor or not, and even classify which type of tumor it is. Unfortunately, this feature won't work on Kaggle, but you can download the notebook and play around with it on your own machine. So, let's get started with some exciting bonus content. Hey there! In this code cell, we have a function called imp underscore pred that takes an argument called upload. This function is used to predict whether an MRI scan has a brain tumor or not, and even classify which type of tumor it is. First, the function loops through the uploaded images and opens them using the image module. Then, it converts the image to a NumPy array using cv2.cvt color and resizes it to 150 by 150 pixels. Next, the image is reshaped to match the input shape of the model and passed to the model.predict function to get the predicted class probabilities. The np.argmax function is used to get the index of the highest probability, which corresponds to the predicted class. Then, the function checks the predicted class and assigns a string label to it based on the index. If the predicted class is 1, which corresponds to no tumor, the function prints a message saying that there is no tumor. Otherwise, it prints a message saying which type of tumor the model predicts it is. That's it for this code cell. Stay tuned for more exciting content. Hey there! In this markdown cell, we have a section where you can upload an image to test the model's performance. You can do this by clicking on the upload button. Once you upload an image, the m underscore pred function we just discussed will be used to predict whether the MRI scan has a brain tumor or not, and even classify which type of tumor it is. So, go ahead and give it a try. Now, let's take a look at this code cell. Here, we are using the widgets module to create a file uploader widget. This widget allows us to upload an image to test our model's performance. 
The file upload function creates the widget and we store it in the uploader variable. Then, we use the display function to display the widget in our Jupyter Notebook. When we run this cell, we will see a button labeled Upload. Clicking on this button will allow us to select an image from our local machine to upload. Once we upload an image, we can use the img underscore pred function we discussed earlier to predict whether the MRI scan has a brain tumor or not, and even classify which type of tumor it is. So, this widget is a useful tool for testing our model's performance on new data. Now that we have uploaded an image using the file uploader widget, we can make predictions on it. Simply click on the predict button below the widget to see the results. The imp underscore pred function we discussed earlier will be used to predict whether the MRI scan has a brain tumor or not, and even classify which type of tumor it is. This is a great way to test the accuracy of our model on new data. Now, let's take a look at the code in this cell. Here, we are creating a button widget using the widgets.button function and storing it in the button variable. The button is labeled predict. Next, we create an output widget using the widgets.output function and store it in the out variable. This widget will display the results of our prediction. We then define a function called on underscore button underscore click that will be called when the button is clicked. This function clears the output widget using the clear underscore output function and then tries to make a prediction using the img underscore pred function we discussed earlier, passing in the uploader variable that contains the uploaded image. If there is an error, such as no image being uploaded or an invalid image file, the function will print an error message. Finally, we use the widgets.vbox function to create a vertical box layout that contains the button and output widgets. This layout is then displayed using the display function. So, when we click on the predict button, the on underscore button underscore click function is called, which clears the output widget and tries to make a prediction using the img underscore pred function. The results of the prediction are then displayed in the output widget. This allows us to easily test our model's performance on new data. In this markdown cell, we have the conclusion of our Jupyter Notebook. We performed image classification using CNN and transfer learning, which gave us an accuracy of around 98%. We also created widgets that can make predictions on an image from your local machine. And with that, we come to the end of our tutorial. Thank you for watching. In this final markdown cell, we have concluded our tutorial on image classification using CNN and transfer learning. We have learned how to visualize training and validation accuracy and loss, make predictions, and evaluate the model's performance using various functions. We have also created widgets that can make predictions on new data, allowing for easy testing of the model's performance. With an accuracy of around 98%, we can confidently say that our model is performing well. Thank you for watching, and we hope this tutorial has been informative and helpful for you.